Well, hello and welcome to this midweek talk. I uh, hope you're doing okay. It's been a little while, hasn't it, since we uh, finished the, the Book of Acts for Christmas break. And now we're picking it up. Last time, if you remember, we left uh, Paul kind of on his knees praying for the Ephesian uh, elders the last time they were going to see him. But what a lasting image of him there on his knees in prayer. So we're going to move into Acts 21. Uh, today what I thought I'd do is I'd read a little bit, then make some comments, read a little bit more, make some comments, and then finish with the last few verses, and then pray. So, uh, so I hope you find it helpful. And let's look at verse 1. After saying farewell to the Ephesian elders, we sailed straight to the island of Kos. The next day we reached Rhodes and then went to Patara. There we boarded a ship sailing for uh, Phoenicia. We sighted the island of Cyprus, passed it on our left and landed at the harbour of Tyre in Syria where the ship was to unload its cargo. We went ashore, found the local believers and stayed with them a week. These believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not go on to Jerusalem. When we returned to the ship at the end of the week, the entire congregation, including women and children, left the city and came down to the shore with us. There we knelt, prayed and said our farewells. Then we went aboard and they returned home. The next stop after leaving Tyre was uh, Ptolemas, where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed for one day. The next day we went on to Caesarea and stayed at the home of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven men who had been chosen to distribute food, someone we've heard earlier on in Acts. He had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. Several days later, a man named Agabus, someone else we've already heard about, a prophet, uh, who also had the gift of prophecy, arrived from Judea. He came over, took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands with it. Then he said, the Holy Spirit declares, so shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the local believers all begged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. But he said, why all this weeping? You're breaking my heart. I am ready not only to be jailed at Jerusalem, but even to die for the sake of the Lord Jesus. When it was clear that we couldn't persuade him, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. So let's pause for a moment uh, and let's think about those words. You know, Again, we get that image of Paul saying goodbye. Again, he's on his knees uh, as we get in verse 5. But then what we get uh, is many people telling Paul, you know, not to go on to Jerusalem. And yet Paul is being led by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. As we read in Acts 20, verses 22 to 23, let me read those to remind you, and now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. And so on one hand it seems like the Holy Spirit is leading Paul and yet on the other it seems as though the same Holy Spirit is leading others to tell Paul not to go. But actually you know I think as we put all of that together, what comes through is that yes, Paul is being led there, but that others are being kind of brought into the picture of what's going to happen to him there, and to, to keep warning him of what's going to happen. And, you know, as he said in chapter 20, he knew that jail and suffering lay ahead. And so as much as these believers try and uh, dissuade him, nothing actually was going to stop him from reaching that destination. And you know, there's, there's a challenge, isn't there, a real challenge here for us, because Paul was fully aware of this suffering that was heading his way, but he didn't stop. He continued his mission. And his chief concern in life was, was not comfort or his own safety or even a long life. His chief purpose was to proclaim Jesus, to, to preach the gospel. And that was whatever the cost. And we discover, and what we discover 
is that actually through all of the sufferings that Paul went through, there was just this incredible amount of fruit that came, that was born. And I kind of wonder whether, you know, we often ask the wrong question. That instead of saying, why is this suffering happening to me? Maybe we should be asking the question, how can I proclaim Jesus in the midst of these trials? And what is God wanting to do in me? During and in this time of trial, that certainly seems to be more where Paul was. Anyway, let's continue the story in verse 15. So after this, we packed our things and left for Jerusalem. Some believers from Caesarea accompanied us and they took us to the home of Nason, a man originally from Cyprus and one of the early believers. When we arrived, the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem welcomed us warmly. The next day, Paul went with us to meet James and that all the elders of the Jerusalem church were present. After greeting them, Paul gave a detailed account of the things God had accomplished among the Gentiles through his ministry. And after hearing this, they praised God. And then they said, You know, dear brother, how many thousands of Jews have also believed, and they all follow the law of Moses very seriously. But the Jewish believers here in Jerusalem have been told that you are teaching all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn their backs on the law of Moses. They've heard that you teach them not to circumcise their children and to follow other customs. What should we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. Here's what we want you to do. We have four men here who have completed their vow. Go with them to the temple and join them in the purification ceremony, praying for them to have their heads ritually shaved. Then everyone, sorry, paying for them to have their heads ritually shaved. And then everyone will know that the rumours are all false and that you yourself observe the Jewish laws. As for the Gentile believers, they should do what we already told them in a letter. They should abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals and from sexual immorality. So Paul went to the temple the next day with the other men. They had already started the purification ritual. So he publicly announced the date when their vows would end and sacrifices would be offered for each of them. The seven days were almost ended when some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul in the temple and roused a mob against him. They grabbed him, yelling, Men of Israel, help us! This is the man who preaches against our people everywhere and tells everyone, everybody, to disobey the Jewish laws. He speaks against the temple and even defiles this holy place by bringing in Gentiles. For earlier that day they'd seen him in the city with Trophimus, a Gentile from Ephesus, and they assumed, wrongly, but they'd assumed that Paul had taken him into the temple. The whole city was rocked by these accusations and a great riot followed. Paul was grabbed and dragged out of the temple and immediately the gates were closed behind him. Okay, let's pause again there. Um, there are some really interesting things going on here. I'm not going to cover all of them. But, you know, as you go back to the beginning of that section, it kind of brings us to our knees in, in worship. Because when you go back to the beginning of Acts and you think where we were at that point before the New Testament church had started, and here we are in chapter 21, and we have seen so many people become believers become part of the church. It seems that now, wherever Paul goes, there's believers. The growth of the church in those early years was just so incredible. And obviously, the main catalyst was Paul, you know, used by God, used by the Spirit. But Paul was really uh, used by God. And we see something of what was taking place as he arrives here in verse 17 you know he's warmly welcomed by his brothers and sisters in Christ and then Paul gives them a detailed account of what God had been doing among the Gentiles I kind of wonder as an aside whether he was just making sure that no one was sleeping on windowsills because of what happened when he'd done this before but thankfully no one seems to have been like that and instead in verse 20 we get after hearing this they praised God and so then they share their good news 
that, you know, dear brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed and they all follow the law of Moses very seriously. And so, you know, this, this is the early church that's growing really quickly in a short period of time. And at the same time, they're working out their theology on the run, if you like, on the go. You know, they don't have the New Testament like we have. They were writing it in part uh, as we go through. And so we get this account with James, you know, the brother of Jesus, the leader of the Jerusalem church, who's got this concern. And, you know, it's not to do with salvation because he was part of the council in Jerusalem and they'd already sorted out all those issues in chapter 15. But whatever was going on at this point with these vows and different things, I think, you know, what, um, what I found of something that John Stott wrote about these words, I think is really helpful. And he says this, they were already agreed doctrinally that salvation was by grace in Christ through faith and ethically that Christians must obey the moral law. So the issue here between them concerned culture, ceremony and tradition. And the solution that they came to was not a compromise, but a concession in the area of practice. And we've thought before, you know, that Paul wanted to do anything, everything possible, that people would be saved, would come to put their faith and trust in Jesus. And so whatever is going on here, commentators kind of disagree about what it might be. There's lots of different options, but Paul's response in all of this and what then takes place actually leads to, uh, to if you like, everything going wrong, but obviously Paul knew what was going to happen because of all that had been prophesied again uh, about him. And so in many ways Luke seems to be taking us down this road of drawing parallels between Jesus and Paul and what took place for both of them in and around Jerusalem and their sufferings. And so the you know, last time we thought a little bit about this and about the journey to Jerusalem, but now Luke seems to take this further. Obviously you know, we need to add in that Paul's sufferings were, were nothing like Christ's and were nothing in what Christ's sufferings would uh, and had achieved. But nevertheless, Jesus and Paul, as we look at the similarities, were both rejected by the people. They were both arrested without cause, they were in prison, they were unjustly accused, they were misrepresented by false witnesses. And you know, next time we'll see that they were slapped uh, in the face, that they were both Paul. Uh, in the next chapter, get slapped in the face in court. They were victims of secret Jewish plots. That they both heard the terrifying noises of a frenzied mob screaming away with him. And they were both subjected to a series of five trials. And in the midst of everything going on, the result is that the temple is rejected. You know, as Jesus dies, the temple curtain was, was torn, was ripped in two. The picture is, you know, the temple's obsolete now. The way to God is now through Jesus, the greater sacrifice that has been offered on the altar of the cross. And here for Paul, as soon as he's dragged out of the temple, we get the words in verse 30, immediately the gates were shut. And John Stott says, uh, to quote him again, the slammed gates seem to symbolise the final Jewish rejection of the gospel. So it was actually an incredibly sad day. And we left with the crowd shouting away with him. And obviously it's nearly 30 years since the crowd had been shouting the same, those words about Jesus. And so the chapter ends with Paul being rescued by that Roman regiment, which could have had up to a thousand soldiers. And so let's read the last bit before I pray. As they were trying to kill him, word reached the commander of the Roman regiment that all Jerusalem was in uproar. 
He immediately called out his soldiers and officers and ran down among the crowd. When the mob saw the commander and the troops coming, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander arrested him and ordered him bound with two chains. He asked the crowd who he was and what he had done. Some shouted one thing and some another. And since he couldn't find out the truth in all, all the uproar and confusion, he ordered that Paul be taken to the fortress. As Paul reached the stairs, the mob grew so violent, the soldiers had to lift him to their, soul, to their shoulders to protect him. And the crowd followed behind shouting, kill him, kill him. As Paul was about to be taken inside, he said to the commander, may I have a word with you? Do you know Greek? The commander asked, surprised, aren't you the Egyptian who led a rebellion some time ago and took 4,000 members of the assassins out into the desert? No, Paul replied, I am a Jew and a citizen of Tarsus in Cilicia, which is an important city. Please let me talk to these people. The commander agreed. So Paul stood on the stairs and motioned to the people to be quiet. Soon a deep silence enveloped the crowd and he addressed them in their own language, Aramaic. Full stop, that's where the chapter ends. And so it leaves us wondering what's going to happen next. And we will find that out next time. But let's pray. Lord, thank you that Paul was so focused on you. So willing to lay down his life, to go through suffering because he wanted people to know the gospel. To come for themselves to put their faith and trust in Jesus. Lord, we ask that you would help us to be willing to lay down our lives, to be willing to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow you. And Lord, too, we pray that you would help us to seek ways to maintain the unity that we have in you, that we'd not cause others to stumble, but that we'd keep our eyes fixed together on Jesus. Lord, I pray that our lips might declare your praise in all the different seasons of our lives. Lord, pray this for his glory and in and through his name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for watching. God bless.